Number 1. Seffarelli disappeared from Fort Myers, Florida on January 5, 2017. She lived with her fiancé and his mother. She ran away from her residence while under the influence of drugs and her fiancé was unable to catch up with her. She left her dentures, purse, money, identification and cellular phone charger behind, and her phone's battery has died since her disappearance. Three days later, she showed up at a Taco Bell restaurant in the 3400 block of South Cleveland Avenue, still wearing the clothes she'd gone missing in and talking to herself. An employee there recognized her from missing persons posters and called her fiancé's mother, who was able to speak to her. Seffarelli told her she would not come home because she knew that she wasn't supposed to be there when she was using drugs. Her fiancé's mother told her to come home immediately, but she didn't come home. She has never been heard from again. It's uncharacteristic of Seffarelli to be out of touch with her family, and they don't think she would have abandoned her son, who was visiting relatives in Connecticut at the time of her disappearance. Her case remains unsolved. Number 2. Anton and his wife, Danka Sesenjever, were walking together near Lido Beach in Sarasota, Florida during the evening hours of November 1, 2001. Anton was last seen in the 400 block of Benjamin Franklin Drive at approximately 9 p.m. He and Danka were walking towards their vehicle, which was parked near St. Armand's Circle in the Lido Key area. Danka told authorities that Anton believed she was walking in the wrong direction shortly before he disappeared. She continued for approximately 100 yards before checking on his progress. She said that Anton often fell behind her during their walks, but she would periodically stop and allow him to catch up with her. Anton has never been heard from again. He had no money or identification on he person when he disappeared. Danka searched for him for approximately 90 minutes before contacting authorities at 10.30 p.m. The Sarasota Police Department received widespread criticism for its initial investigation into Anton's disappearance. The responding officer spoke with Danka for a short period of time before conducting a search of the immediate area. An aerial search was not initiated until the following afternoon. Officials admitted that the department initially mishandled Anton's case. They have since increased public exposure for his disappearance. Anton and Danka resided in Hemhofen, Germany for the majority of the year. They spent winters at their second home in the 1800 block of Tulip Street in Sarasota. Anton is a retired architect. His case remains unsolved. Number 3 Curtis was last seen with his wife, Marjorie, at a dinner in West Palm Beach, Florida on June 14, 1955. They left the dinner at approximately 10 p.m. to return to their home in the 200 block of Dyer Road in Manalapan, Florida. Neither of the Chillingworths have been heard from again. Curtis and Marjorie had hired a carpenter to build a playground for their grandchildren at their home. The carpenter arrived as scheduled at 8 a.m. on June 15 and found the house deserted and the door open. Curtis was scheduled to preside over a hearing in West Palm Beach at 10 a.m., but never arrived. Authorities went to search the Chillingworth residence at noon. The porch light was shattered and there were blood drops on the walkway to the beach. Two used spools of adhesive tape were located, one on the beach and one in the living room. The Chillingworth swimming suits were left behind, as was some cash. Curtis's Plymouth was located at the residence with the keys still it in the ignition. An extensive search turned up no sign of either Curtis or Marjorie. They were declared legally dead in 1957 and were given a headstone in Oak Lawn Cemetery in West Palm Beach. In 1960, Joseph Alexander Peel Jr. was charged with murdering the Chillingworths. He was the municipal judge for West Palm Beach in 1955 and noted for his corruption and incompetence. Curtis was the senior circuit judge of Palm Beach County and Peel's superior, he had gotten the job at age 26, the youngest person in Florida history to do so. Curtis had warned Peel several times about his judicial misconduct. In 1953, after Peel represented both sides in a divorce case, Curtis told him it was his last chance and he would face disciplinary action next time. In retaliation, Peel ordered Floyd Albert Lucky Hill's Apfel to kill the Chillingworths. Photographs of Peel and Hills Apfel are posted with this case summary. Hills Apfel confessed to the Chillingworths' murders in 1960. He stated he and a friend, George David Bobby Lincoln, had killed Curtis and Marjorie together. A photograph of Lincoln is posted with this case summary. Hills Apfel and Peel were both arrested after the confession. Lincoln was already incarcerated in a federal prison on unrelated charges by 1960. He was granted immunity from prosecution for the murders in return for agreeing to testify as a witness. 
Hulzapfel pleaded guilty to both murders and agreed to testify against Peel. He was sentenced to death. At Peel's trial, Lincoln and Hulzapfel stated they had taken Curtis and Marjorie out into the ocean on a boat, taped their hands, strapped lead weights to their bodies, and threw them overboard, still alive. Curtis was still able to swim in spite of his taped hands and the weights. Lincoln and Hulzapfel hit him with a shotgun, but he continued to float. They had to pull him back onto the board and put an additional weight on him before he sank. Lincoln and Hulzapfel stated they had not received payment from Peel for committing the murders. Peel was convicted of being an accessory to Curtis's murder and pleaded no contest to his role in Marjorie's death. He served 18 years in a Florida state prison, then was released in 1979 to serve a federal sentence in Missouri for an unrelated mail fraud conviction. He was paroled in 1981. Peel was suffering from cancer by this time and died only nine days after his release from prison. Days before his death, he gave a newspaper interview wherein he stated he had not ordered the Chillingworth's murders, but he had been aware of them and had done nothing to stop them. Hulzapfel's death sentence was commuted to life in prison in 1966. He was a model prisoner and died in 1996, still incarcerated. Lincoln finished his federal prison term in 1962. He died in 2004. Curtis was considering retirement by the time of his disappearance. He had made a small fortune in land investments on top of his $18,000 annual judge's salary. He and Marjorie had three children together. Although their bodies were never recovered, foul play is suspected in their cases due to the circumstances involved. Number 4 Chisholm was last seen in Orlando, Florida on February 5, 1988. He left his home in the 7900 block of Albania Avenue and went to the Altamont Mall, where he used the mall's phone to call his parents and girlfriend. His parents lived in Dayton, Ohio at the time, his girlfriend was in Irvine, Kentucky. He never arrived home and has never been heard from again. Harold Suggs was subsequently charged with stealing Chisholm's car, a blue Pontiac Grand Prix, with the Ohio license plate number 823 non. He was seen in Stark, Florida, 130 miles northwest of Orlando, on the day after Chisholm's disappearance, driving a car matching the description of Chisholm's and wearing a jacket similar to one that belonged to Chisholm. Three weeks after Chisholm went missing, police found his car with Suggs inside it and he tried to run when he saw them. Chisholm's eyeglasses, books and jacket were inside the car and there was blood in the backseat. A radio, cassette player, citizens band radio and radar detector were missing from the vehicle and it had been driven about 2,000 miles since Chisholm had disappeared. Nearby, in a dumpster, were Chisholm's bloodstained shirt and other clothes, as well as a bloodstained crowbar. His girlfriend's phone number and a bank deposit slip were in the shirt pocket and DNA testing proved the blood was his. When questioned, Suggs at first claimed he lived with Chisholm and that Chisholm had let him borrow the car, but he was unable to provide an accurate address. He changed his story and said he'd met Chisholm at a bar in Orlando and they decided to get an apartment together. Suggs had no permanent address at the time of his arrest and he has used numerous aliases in the past. Police believe he murdered Chisholm, but he has never been charged in connection with his disappearance and the auto theft charge was dropped after a key witness was unable to testify. Chisholm played piano in a local gospel group called Loretta Carter and the sounds of praise at the time of his disappearance. He was planning to leave Orlando in March 1988 and move back to Ohio to work with his father in a ministry. Foul play is suspected in his case, which remains unsolved. Number 5 Clark traveled to Panama City, Florida, from her home in Ontario, Canada in January 1984. She was visiting friends in Panama City at the time and checked into Continental Condominiums for her stay. She was last seen having dinner with her friends, who were staying in the same condo, three days after her arrival, her friends reported her to authorities as a missing person when they failed to locate Clark on January 4, 1984. Her condominium was searched by investigators shortly thereafter. Clark had left all her belongings behind, as well as a note insinuating she might have taken her own life. No other evidence was located. She has never been heard from again. Clark's case was reopened by Panama City authorities in 1997. Another search of the area was conducted with cadaver dogs at that time, but Clark was not recovered. Investigators sent Clark's possible suicide note to the United Secret Service in 1997 for handwriting analysis to determine whether she had in fact written it herself. The results have not been released. In March 2000, an inmate in a Florida prison wrote a letter to a friend saying he had killed Clark. 
Police investigated his account and concluded the man was not, in fact, involved in Clark's disappearance. A woman matching Clark's description died in a New York City hospital in May 2000, but it turned out she was not the missing woman. Clark's case remains open. She has never been located, but is presumed to be deceased. Number 6. Clemens was last seen outside a residence in Miramar, Florida on May 20, 2018. She was on her way to work at Jackson Memorial Medical Center, where she was a phlebotomist, but never arrived there and has never been heard from again. Her car keys, house keys and cellular phone disappeared with her. She left her red 2018 Volkswagen Jetta behind her home with her wallet inside, it contained credit cards and $300 in cash. She also left her driver's license and passport behind. When police checked Clemens' home in the 7200 block of Venetian Street, they found food in a pot on the stove and a fan and television set on in the bedroom. They didn't find any blood or evidence of foul play. It's uncharacteristic of her to miss work, she had a near-perfect attendance record. Clemens had been in a relationship with Jack Freeman Jr., and he was the father of one of her four children. A photo of Freeman is posted with this case summary. Authorities learned they had married in 2016, something Clemens' relatives and loved ones were unaware of. He had been seeing another woman for about 10 years, something he says Clemens knew about, and he said he'd moved into his girlfriend's apartment in the 2400 block of Sherman Circle North in late April. He failed a polygraph about Clemens' case, showing deception on all of his answers. Police stated there were 22 separate reports of domestic violence by Freeman against Clemens and other women, but he wasn't charged in any of the cases. He was arrested five times on domestic violence charges between 2000 and 2017, but each time the case was dropped. He was charged with aggravated battery with a deadly weapon in 2007, but that charge was also dropped. Freeman initially stated he hadn't had contact with Clemens for about a month prior to her disappearance, then changed his story, and it had actually been more than two months since he'd seen her. In fact, they'd been in touch, at least by text, up until her disappearance. Text messages between Clemens and Freeman indicate the two of them were fighting just prior to her disappearance. Cellular phone records indicate the couple's phones were together at around dawn on May 22, two days after she was last seen. The phones were tracked first to Clemens' home and then to Freeman's girlfriend's apartment. On May 24, the phones pinged again at Clemens' address. Authorities are investigating Clemens' case as a homicide and Freeman is considered a person of interest in her case. Her disappearance remains unsolved.